Uh, we have a number of important reports to consider this morning, and I'm sure we'll deal with them in our usual efficient manner. Item number one on the... Elaine? Just, just for uh, information, um, I see Councillor Marshall's name is on the front page, but he's not a member of this committee. Nick's just about to cover that in surrounding apologies. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't like him to be marked as absent when he wasn't actually on the committee. Do you want to give us a sermon and apologies, Nick? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, we have 12 members I think the numbers may have changed. 14. We've got 14 members present at the start of the meeting. We've, we have apologies from um, Councillor Fairburn. Um, Leader, you are right. Um, Councillor Marshall won't be marked as um, not present. As um, there's apologies, there seem to have been a glitch with the front sheet there of the agenda, but we'll we'll attend to that after the meeting. Okay, item number two is any declarations of interest. Is there any members who want to make a declaration of interest? Nope. Item number three is the minutes of the, our previous meeting on the 29th of October. Are we quite happy to approve those minutes? Yes. Fantastic. Um, item number four this morning is the Transformation Programme Update Report by the Head of People in Transformation. This report provides members with an update on the activity to progress the transformation programme since our last meeting in October. A second member seminar was held on the 11th of November this year to provide the opportunity for a detailed discussion with the event leads on each of uh, the, the different events. Heather Carnican and a number of the event leads are here to answer any questions on the report and I propose that we sort of deal with this in the same way that we did last time. So first of all, is there any questions on the actual a report and then we'll take each event in turn. Jeff? Just a 3.1 there. Uh, it it um, emphasises we need to find another 46 million across the period uh, by 2021 2022. I think, given this is a public document, what we need to do is to actually also state that we've had to find 106 million to date. So this isn't a new process. And it's on top of that. So it'll take us up to. By my calculations, Paul, probably correct me, something like 40% cut in the, uh, the annual budget. And, you know, I've been making this point at uh, community council meetings and parent council meetings, and people are amazed by the sort of uh, size of cuts we've had to face. I think you're absolutely right, Jeff. I can see Paul nodding, um, and certainly in a lot of the, at the events and in the information that's been shared um, more widely, um, that the fact that we've already had to make £106 million worth of cuts has been reflected and obviously these are in addition to those cuts. Willie? Yeah, Chair, thanks for letting me in. Uh, Jeff just referred to 49 million. We don't know if, if it's going to be 49 million or indeed what the settlement's going to be this year. Uh, and from your own party, and I heard for Ted last night, you know, we're going to get 100 billion, uh, you know, when Labour gets re returned. Uh, so so uh, that'll have uh, an effect on the settlement, as will any of the others that are promising and making promises that they're going to increase public spending. So the 49 million is not uh, the, the, the exact figure, because we don't know what that is. Uh, and the other thing, uh, Chair, uh, and you, I uh, copied you and Andy Fergus into the correspondence yesterday, we've had these transformation meetings. And from that, there's further literature coming out. One was that the, the, the BMAX uh, team were going to be uh, stood down or, 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 or done away with. Now that's after the transformation meetings. And likewise, in additional support for uh, learner teachers, you know, 48% are going to be reduced in uh, a, a additional support for learner. And there's a letter out to that effect after the transformation meetings. And it was made clear, and I think it was at every transformation meeting, that the, uh, nobody wanted to see a reduction in the additional support needs budget. Now, either we're taking cognizance of what the people are saying, or we're just used it as a, 
a, a PR exercise and then ignore what they have said. But for a letter then to come out after the transformation meeting is a bit disingenuous of the people who have gone to these meetings and on it they, they say, take that out, take that out, at least in the one I was at. So where do we stand? So I think certainly, you know, we, we don't know what the funding settlement is going to be next year and we probably will not know until January. Um, I very much hope that it will not be um, the, the, the funding cuts that are outlined in this report and certainly not voting for that. But that I'm sure that we're all making that point out with uh, this chamber. I think what we have to remember is, is that actually the transformation programme has identified areas that we could invest and we could improve services. And I'm very clear that actually if we get a funding settlement that isn't um, you know, a £12 million funding gap but actually gives us some money to invest, the transformation programme has identified areas of investment in education, uh, in waste, in tackling the climate crisis that we could take advantage of. I think you need to be quite clear that there is a transformation programme that we're running, but as outlined and agreed by full council in June, there was the list of uh, cut proposals that were um, published. I think you're referring to, and I know that in your email you'd referred to, and that they are out for public consultation. And that consultation has taken place and those views are being fed back in. I'm not quite sure the specific letter that you talk about, but I don't know if Gillian has anything to add to that. Could share that out with the meeting. I would quite happy to see it myself. I'll share that with anybody. I just don't have it on me just now, but I'll share that with anyone. Uh, and and the, the, the identified cuts that you refer to, uh, Adam, then these are over and above what's in uh, the, the document that went out. And what I'm saying is it's a bit disingenuous. You know, the, 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 the BMAX uh, team, the, the, the ASN, these are all things that, you know, again, and, and you refer to it as investment, they are cuts. No matter which way you, you want to dress it up, that's what they are. No, what I said is, is that if we have a funding settlement that does not have a, a funding gap and actually gives us money to invest in those identified areas of investment. But I think that we've made that point. Jane? Uh, thank you, Chairman. You've actually covered a couple of points I was going to make, but, but the issue is that we've, we, we can only deal with what we've got in front of us and have been and what has been published. So I, I would suggest strongly that we do actually really focus on what's here. And I also remember um, in the meetings that we had earlier on that we decided we would take a reasonably grown-up approach to this, which is that we would put the information in front of the public so the public knew the options which were going to be presented and all the issues. That is all that is being described at the moment. No decisions have been made as far as I'm concerned. I haven't agreed to anything, and that's still for the future. So I would suggest that we look at what's in front of us, Chairman. Ian. Thank you, uh, Chair. I think Willie brings up a, an important point, but it goes back to the points that we made already by other members, including yourself. We don't know what that settlement is. Ultimately, any benefits that we receive from whatever government is, is returned after the 12th of December. The Scottish Government will have a decision to make there, there after that in, in regards to how where they prioritise local authorities at that point, and we'll see that as it comes through. It'll maybe be picked up as, as we go through the, the different appendices under workforce, but at 3.2 it talks about the pressures and stresses and so on and so forth. And I, have to, I think I have to mention it so that the no compulsory redundancy policy is in place. How is that applied? I think we've been told in the past that may well, in year three it might be untenable, but you just need reassurance in regards to how sustainable is our current policies as we go forward running about a workforce strategy. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, um, it's, it's tenable just now, and I think we'd, we need to look for a political decision to be made as whether we move to compulsory redundancies. And obviously, I'll be happy to bring a report if, we, if and when we come to that. But we're, we're actually doing OK. It's going to be challenging. It always has been challenging, making those un unprecedented cuts and changes over the last several years. 106 million has been mentioned. Um, We'll continue with the, the current tools we have at our disposal and we're looking to enhance that, as you can see from the, the feedback from the, the workforce event. Any other questions before we head into the appendices? Jeff? 
I, I know we have to deal with what we've got in front of us, but uh, obviously there's, there's going to be a delay in the allocation from the Scottish Government to the local authorities because the budget hasn't been passed in uh, Westminster. And if we've got another hung parliament, that could take some time to actually to do that. But I heard on the radio that I think it's already been announced that it's a 2% real terms increase in the Scottish allocation. Is that correct, Paul? The, there has been figures published at a national level in terms of uh, the level of funding for Scotland uh, for next year. However, those figures could be subject to change. Uh, the UK government will announce its budget details after the, the election. Uh, and then beyond that, obviously, the Scottish government will determine how it allocates the funding to the various portfolios, including local government. So, But there, there has been figures there that were, are the basis for those discussions, but they are subject to change following the developments over the upcoming period. Okay. Uh, okay, so we'll move to the first event newspaper that we have, and that is a partnership approach to earlier intervention. And we've got Lillian Kringles here to, to lead on that report. Is there any questions or thoughts that members want to share at this moment on that particular event newspaper? Jeff? It's to do with the out of region uh, placements. We're spending nearly £3.9 million pounds a year. Uh, on these out-of-region placements. How much realistic, I know, I know we've got a programme of trying to bring these uh, uh, folk back into region, how much realistically can we achieve in terms of that and what would we need to invest in order to achieve that, um, uh, bring them back into region? Uh, thank you, Councillor Lever. Um, members are aware that that's been our focus for a considerable period of time to try and reduce the amount of young people that are placed out with the region um, for some of our children with learning disabilities, we don't have the infrastructure within region that would be able to provide the service that they require. Um, and currently we have three young people who require um, high levels of security. So we would not have um, the, the uh, key infrastructure to allow them to come back to this region. However, we are looking at transformation programmes with those young people to see if we can reduce the level of risk that they currently pose and looking at what, what that will mean when they transition into adult services. Um, I think we will always have young people out of region because for a region the size of Dunfries and Galloway, for example, we could never facilitate a secure unit. So it would be something that we will always have to use external placements for some of our young people that may require that particular example. But absolutely our, our um, ethos has always been to try and have our young people back in region. Uh, we are currently doing some work with our third sector partners to see if um, we can do a much more bespoke service for Dumfries and Galloway Council, um, linking in with some of our third partner providers. And actually at the transformation event, some of the input from them was really positive about some of the things that they may be able to bring to the table. The challenge for us is undoubtedly how do we run both of those systems at any one time. So how do you have the resource to allow you to develop those partnership working while still maintaining those young people out of the region that we currently are required to care for and those placements um, absolutely are the only ones available at this time to meet their needs. Uh, good morning, Chair. I'm, I'm very happy to be on your committee. It's great to see you're rising to a seat of power. Um, probably your success is inverse to that of the Labour Party, somewhat ironic, ironically. But um, as you know, my style is quite superficial, so it won't take me long to catch up on the briefs here. Um, I noticed in a committee I was in several months ago that um, we, were, we were going to spend £600,000 on one, one um, young girl, I think it was, uh, to be in secure accommodation. I've, uh, I've jotted up the figures here of the, the 11 plus the 9 uh, that's 20. 20 uh, people within our area are getting more than 1% of our entire um, budget. Um, the example that I'm, it's the only one I'm familiar with, actually, and it seemed that um, what was said was that although this, this person was attacking people on a regular basis and some uh, one time with a serious injury to them at least, and um, that um, we, our, or our team, 
um, wasn't sure whether this sh should be um, criminalized, but I think there's the actual um, disproportionality here. Uh, and the Just on a point of uh, uh, yep. order, I guess. I'm not sure what the point of order is, so it might not be a point of order, but can we maybe avoid going into individual details that might identify potentially um, people in, who are vulnerable? And it's just to maybe get advice on where we can go with this, because I'm not sure that's... That, that's quite opportune. My understanding is that that was possibly taken in private session. So, yeah, I was just about to say that, Chair, that that uh, report was taken in private because we were sharing information um, which is would be irrelevant to be shared publicly. I think when we were just focus on the need to focus on the report, of course there will be information that's been received previously that will inform our thoughts and our decision making, but essentially, you know, it's on the reports that are in front of us today, please, David. Okay, so given that it's a very large amount of money, um, I would just like to state a preference that when we are assessing what to do, the, the disproportionality, the financial cost, and therefore the opportunity lost to us all and other vulnerable um, cases uh, should be taken into account when, when choosing um, exactly what is best for that particular individual. I think we're, it's, it's too skewed. It comes a point where it's just, it's just too costly to optimize for an individual. Um, thanks for that uh, comment, Councillor James. I think the reality is that the professional judgment of the social work will assess the need of the child and we will um, require by law to meet that need. That, that would mean that there was absolutely no limit to what we could spend. We could spend the whole um, 300 million or, or so on, on one person. I think, that. David, maybe we need it to, has to be sort, a point. sort of reflect that, you know, I think that uh, Lillian gave a, quite a robust answer. There are some young people who require that level um, of funding for those tax and meet our statutory obligations. Is there no upper limit? That would be my question then. We will always assess with regards to the outcomes for the young person. That's a yes then. Right. Okay, Jock. Just a quick aside, Chair, we maybe should refer the councillor on to the social work to get an assessment done. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I actually do, I mean, I understand the, the, that there's a, a pressure and sometimes you have, to, you have to meet and address the risk because that's ultimately what, what Chief Social Work Officer would, would protect us uh, in the sense that we would protect the, the person and also protect the council and make sure we're doing the right thing. But there is, a, there is a point at which there has to be uh, negotiations perhaps at a clausal and or national level uh, in terms of how the wider issue about dealing with um, a small number of, relatively small number of people thankfully in this vulnerable position can be dealt with maybe at a more effective level nationally given that lo some local authorities will not have the capability in their region to deal with that. And there are, there's a, there are issues like that and I understand they might be sort of at least getting raised uh, if not taken forward at national level. I don't know if the Chief Social Work Officer can add something to that through yourself, Chair. Yep, well then. Uh, happy to, to answer that. Um, yeah, there is ongoing negotiations. All the placements, um, external placements for all local authorities are managed under the Scotland XL contract. So the cost of the placements are set. Um, and there has been some challenges nationally, which has been raised through COSLA and Social Work Scotland to the Scottish Government with regards to the cost of that contract. Willie. Yeah, Chair, I think it's well laid out here, and I think if we all could look at it, key events, questions, and, and uh, for our children and young people, what the services are about, and it's the bullet point which meets the needs and improves the life chances of our most vulnerable children and young people, and I think we've got to focus on that as to how we meet that need, and there'll be different needs with, uh, with different children. But uh, you and I were at a, uh, and Andy were at a committee, a sub, uh, sorry, working group, on Friday. And what I would hope that the thread running through all uh, these uh, transformations, news, whatever they are, that we do look at the anti-poverty strategy of the Council uh, and that we very much focus on that as well in terms of that we're not doing anything that would cut across our strategy in terms of anti-poverty. And I'm quite sure uh, in social work and other departments we will meet a uh, high degree of poverty, children who, who are suffering where we've got, uh, uh, I think the figure is one in four nationally and we may even be one in three. So I would hope that whatever we're doing, we're no uh, cutting across, you know, the, the strategy that exists uh, against uh, poverty. 
I think certainly from what I saw at the, at the particular event, the, the Council's tackling poverty um, strategy was very much uh, in everybody's minds and, and a part of that event. Ian? Just a small point relating back to what David just mentioned. So whether it was legal services, whether it's communities, whether it's the roads, whether it's social work, for instance, when we set a budget on an annual basis, we pretty much ring fence each department a level of funding, is my understanding. So just look for the reassurances. I think we've seen it in the past. So say it was social work, and they went into the rover spend at a point where it was rather than 78 million, it was 79 million because of particular pressures. Before that decision was made, it would come back to council. Council members would see that, have oversight, get points of clarification and make that decision at that point. So whether it's social work or whether it's any other department, it isn't an open book approach where you can just write a blank cheque. Yeah, that's a fair point. Of course, it is highlighted in a, in a future report uh, on this agenda. Any other further questions on this particular transformation event? No. We will move. Oh, sorry, Elaine. Just a brief point. You've um, flagged up the fact that the early intervention can save money for other departments. Uh, and I just wondered if there'd been any progress on how that actually is reflected for social work. And it wouldn't necessarily just be within the council, it could be health service and so on as well. I mean, clearly, um, as I've already shared with members, the outcome of the um, poverty funding that allowed us to do early intervention uh, showed that that is the pathway. Uh, we have already started to, to look at some work with our um, third sector partners to see if we can do some bespoke work with them within the, the local authority. Um, and we are currently developing a business case as to what level of funding we may be required to run, to run that twin track approach. So that's in hand. OK, we'll move on to the public transport and travel themed event. And we have Richard Greaves and Douglas Kirkpatrick here. Is there any questions that members wanted to ask? Katie. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've got the figures in front of us, and I'm looking at this, um, the satisfaction survey. Can I ask how many people were actually surveyed, and how did we reach those people? Because, you know, I would love to use public transport. I've got massive concerns about connectivity. I can't get to work in time on the public transport. I didn't see any opportunity for me to feed back into that survey. And if we're only asking people who are existingly using the service, you know, it's a really skewed group of people. So my question is, how many were surveyed and where was that pool of people surveyed from? Where was the pool from? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hagman. Um, yeah, in terms of the, uh, the, the key facts and the background information, that is specifically in regard to the, the passenger satisfaction survey. So it is the, the users of the, uh, of the services that were, uh, that were spoken to in, in that regard. Um, clearly, in terms of the review moving forward and the three-year strategy for transportation, it would be our intention to target the non-users and potential users in terms of the, the satisfaction and the, and the requirements of uh, public transportation and travel across across the region. Uh, if I may, Chair, I pass on to Douglas, who's got the specifics in terms of the, 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 the response to the, to the specific question. Douglas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, the survey is undertaken every second year by um, Passenger Focus who are an independent travel watchdog across all public transport. The sample size in Dumfries and Galley was, was 624, and they are um, surveys that are undertaken at bus stop, and they are passengers. As Richard said, though, that will certainly be something we'll be looking at, is the non-passengers and the reasons why, as, part, as we develop this going forward. Katie. If I could just come back, obviously our region is enormous. I travel quite a lot through our towns. I never saw anybody standing at a bus stop, certainly in Ward 2. Was it across the region or was it only in Dumfries? Um, my mother doesn't drive. She uses the buses all the time. As far as I'm aware, she's never been asked. So it's just, you know, is that right across the region or is it specifically focused, say, in our large centres? Douglas. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, to my knowledge, it was across different um, the, the key locations across the, the region. So Newton Stewart was one, um, Stranraer, Dumfries. I can actually get you more information. It's an independent body. We don't actually control who does the survey in, but we have we do take a report, full report to, to the Swiss Trans Board every two years. So I can give you that information. Okay. Any further questions, uh, Stephen? Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, it's just on the opportunities to transform public transport and travel. 
uh, on page 18. Um, obviously, the first one there on the list, the uh, first bullet point there at, in the bottom half of the, the page is the need to tra champion the, chim uh, sorry, the climate change agenda by supporting behavioural change in regard to travel. Obviously, the behavioural change is probably the key part of that, um, given that that seems to be the thrust of, the, of our adopted policy. But uh, the other part that mentions behavioural change is the parking review charging um, as a mechanism, if you like, that could lead to behavioural change. Um, so is there a sort of tie up there and are these going to be joined together in some way? Is that the sort of opportunity for the synergy to go forward? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Thompson. Uh, yeah, there was certainly a, a significant amount of discussion and debate at the transformation event aligned with climate change and indeed the opportunities to, uh, to support uh, our commitments uh, by reviewing the, the current travel arrangements. So again, in terms of the three-year review, uh, the answer to the question is absolutely yes. We'll, we'll look at all different opportunities in terms of how we might move forward to encourage behavioural change aligned to the climate change agenda. Okay. Helene. So in the section on opportunities, it also makes reference to the opportunities provided by the Transport Scotland Bill. Uh, and I just wondered what progress was made at looking at those opportunities and whether there was any sorts of timescales in terms of, you know, wh whether we're running our own bus service or whether we're uh, taking part in a, a larger conglomerate looking at bus services. I just wondered if we had any further progress on that and any sort of timescale. I think in addition, it would be useful to know if there's been any funding made available for that. Richard? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair and Leader. Um, we, uh, Douglas and I, met with the uh, service providers as the first part of the, the review process um, last week, um, and uh, we outlined all of the opportunities uh, and uh, the need to review the current infrastructure and the current arrangements <coughs> with them. Uh, we're obviously keen to work with current users in terms of a partnership approach moving forward, but we were very clear that the opportunities that are presented to us as a consequence of the new transport bill will be fully explored as part of the process as well. Uh, and we'll certainly do that as part of the develop development of the three-year strategy. Uh, again, Chair, maybe pass on to Douglas in terms of potential funding opportunities. Yes, yes thank you, Chair. Yes, we're, we're working very closely with other local authorities who are looking at this. And I have a meeting with Glasgow City Council um, this week to discuss their, their thoughts on how to take the, it's now a transport act. It became an act in, on the 15th of November. It's now had royal assent, so we're just waiting for that to be enacted. So we are working very fast on that. As well. It's a very fast-moving agenda across all the authorities at this time. David. Thank you, Chair. Um, it might have been better if this was a, a, a transport um, review or a consultation rather than just public transport in isolation, because public transport doesn't um, work in isolation and one of the overlaps would be is, is parking. Um, town buses um, seem to go around quite often in, in my neck of the woods fairly empty and yet if I, if I take the parochial example of, the, of a link between um, Castle Douglas and Dalbiti, there's no, there's no direct link. Um, was, um, was that brought up at all, um, such direct links and alternative uses for, for town buses when um, you know, people need to get to work at certain times, and it's so um, useful to have a direct link at those particular times. I think just to clarify, the, the event was public transport and travel. As Councillor Thompson had raised a minute ago, there was elements of parking and such like. Richard? Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, certainly the, uh, the transformation event uh, explored the, the, the scale and complexity of the current model. Um, and there was recognition that the, the current model is pretty fragile in terms of uh, how the different transportation arrangements uh, are in place and whether they're delivered by partner agencies, uh, but whether they're the commercial routes, whether they're um, uh, subsidised routes, whether they're the statutory functions that we're re required to provide in terms of school transport. Um, I too have raised similar questions and, and comments with colleagues in regard to uh, the popularity of some bus routes and there's a clearly an, an opportunity to review the, the, the routes. There's an opportunity and a real desire to look at community transports initiatives and a more targeted approach than, than a historical timetabled uh, uh, provision. So absolutely all of these things will be included as part of the review moving forward. Yep. Willie. My question was asked by Elaine and answered by Richard and Douglas. So I've been just waiting on that future report. Any further questions on public? Oh, sorry, Katie. Yeah. 
Thank you, Chair, for letting me come back in. Um, obviously, we've talked quite a lot about buses just now. I would just like to touch on trains and ask where any discussions had on train services. Obviously, the title of this news is Transformation, and I know that there is a group of people. Certainly, I would welcome a new train line between Strindar and Dumfries to open. Was that even remotely discussed? Um, but also, um, there's the train service from Lockerbie. Now, if anybody has had to go to the Central Belt in the last couple of months, it's a horrific service at the moment. And I wonder if that was touched upon in terms of transformation. There's trains being cancelled constantly. The trains are being delayed. I mean, it's, it's great because you get your money back all the time on the, on the travel because there's so many delays. Um, what I would say is in terms of our connections to Carlisle via Dumfries, I travelled from Switzerland all the way back to Dumfries on the, trail, on the train and the only service to be running on time with Wi-Fi, with an option for me to charge my devices, was the Carlisle to Dumfries train, which considering even in Switzerland they didn't manage a train on time, which you know is really, really welcome. Um, but where are we in terms of our train provision? Because clearly there are massive issues at Lockerbie with the train timetables there, of which obviously another committee has been, you know, highlighted that issue. There's concerns with Strunjar that you can't get the bus to link up with the train at Strunjar. You know, has it even been, was it discussed? Because it's not, there doesn't seem to be any opportunities or any issues regarding transformation in this paper. Douglas. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, trains was not the focus of it. It was very much public transport because that's where our budget sits. We have no budget provision for any train um, activity. That's led by um, franchises either from the Scottish government or from the UK government. Uh, trains were discussed at the meeting, though, and connectivity and very much interchange. And part of any new model will look very closely at how we deliver interchange. The responsibility for uh, rail really sits with Swiss Trans Board within Dumfries and Galloway, and we are very much on. We've got a paper going uh, to our board next Friday, which will have an update about the Lockerbie situation, and uh, we're very unhappy uh, with that. But again, all we can do is um, lobby and uh, against the current position and highlight it to the DFT. And then the franchise itself is not within our control, and we have no nothing other than a voice in that to say, but we are uh, very much, trains will be a key part going forward. Sorry. Unhappiness is one word. Katie? Yeah, I was just going to say, do we not have funding part of that? You know, you're saying we, we only have a voice, but surely do we not, as Swiss Trans, we as a council put money into Swiss Trans who's acting on our behalf? So surely we've got a monetary interest in terms of the Swiss Trans board as well. You know, surely we have something more than just our voice. We've got our, our hard cash. Yeah, but I think Douglas was saying that Swiss Trans shouldn't spend any money on rail services. So in terms of even that, it's only that voice, that lobbying voice that we have. Is that correct? Okay. Stephen? Thanks for letting us back in, Chair. Uh, yeah, although I think we did take the decision to support, enable rail transport with car parking facilities, etc. Um, it's just on page... Uh, Maybe 19. Um, could I just make a comment? I'm just thinking the black background's maybe not so great for printers, um, and it must use a horrendous amount of ink. So is maybe that something, just in terms of design going forward, sort of black and white's usually more environmentally friendly. But uh, just on the top right corner there, you've got the one to six um, TNF travel need factors. And I'm wondering, that may overlay quite differently on how people actually use transport rather than how we prioritise how we support transport. So I'm just wondering, is there information that could be available, um, perhaps out with the committee, that could be circulated so members understood in terms of actual usage of transport, people use it in this way. However, the way we're um, scoring it is, is in that way. So I'm just wondering, there might, be a, there might not be a one-to-one -one correspondence. Douglas and Richard know, and I think that's something that we can get to, to members. I think uh, Lillian has a right idea by using a tablet, so I think we can maybe all learn from that. Any other questions? David? Just uh, see, I know you said it was an independent group carried out the survey, but I'm interested to see that there's no thing about the state of the buses at present, because I know the tenders are up for grab next April and August, but my biggest complaint lately has been the service breaking down, and that's the Castle Douglas and Dobiti, they don't free service. And some of the buses, to be honest, as a regular bus user, they're not fit for the roads. 
I'm just surprised that that independent company never had that in their survey thing. Okay, any further questions on this particular event? So we'll move on to the next one, which is our workforce, which was the second event of our workforce to take place. And we've got Paul Clark in here. Any questions for Paul? Nope. Uh, David, is that a hand? Pardon? Yes. Um, thank you. I have um, two. Um, one is about participation requests. Uh, I'm going to bring this up at every opportunity. Um, there is a potential workforce out there in Dumfries and Galloway that's not being harnessed. We've had this uh, scheme has been um, possible for about two years. There's been very little take up. I've seen as much evidence of take up as I have of us working against it by withdrawing uh, help in kind for, uh, for people who would actually do the work for us. Um, I advocate a system of uh, paying um, communities who would like to take over um, the duties of the council as we retrench from those duties rather than us just striking them off in a binary manner as them, them ceasing to exist. Because if we were to fund them to, let's say, 20 to 6% of what it cost us, it would be a win-win. And I think uh, unless we try that, we're not going to find out what the uh, potential is for that. Now, there hasn't been any support for that uh, from councillors, but I think there is um, support out there for this, and we need to look at it as part of the transformation, because that could be a very big part of our transformation. Um, I attended an event um, for, I think, the council interns part of this consultation, and I asked a question, what was our number one priority? Why were we here? Was it A, to self-serve and be for our workforce, or was it to deliver for uh, the residents of Dumfries and Galloway? And astonishingly, or maybe not astonishingly, I, I had the, the officers answer that they were both joint number one priorities. Now that might have been laudable back in the day when there was loads of money, but you can't have joint number one priorities. You've got to make tough decisions. The leader has told us we're going to have to downsize uh, the workforce dramatically. Doing that within the context of no compulsory redundancy is just hopelessly inefficient. The public know that and need to change. So I'd like to propose a moment, an amendment, which I've just jotted down here. That would be a new item, 2.6. Note, the Council's duty to serve the residents of Dumfries and Galloway supersedes its desire to optimise conditions for its workforce. Uh, I would support something similar if I can get a seconder. Thank you. I think on your first point, in the budgets, since I've been here, there has been an element actually of, particularly I'm thinking of the community support hub model, where we have given 80% of the budget, and on a second year then given 60% of the budget, then on a fourth, third year given 40% of the budget, for example. And, uh, you know, that is essentially what you're talking about. And certainly the Clean DG initiative has, um, you, you know, meant that communities are taking on some of that responsibility. And I think in relation to your second point, I would remind you that as a councillor, we are the employer of the workforce in Dumfries and Galloway Council. In order to deliver for the people in Dumfries and Galloway, you need to have members of staff who can deliver on the ground. So I think we want to be quite careful in some of the remarks that you're making. Any other points? Ian? I suppose you can back through the budget process. I remember going back a number of years, uh, probably 10 or 12 even, with big, the big society was, was a big project at the time from the, the, the then uh, government in power. And that aligns exact, exactly really to what David's saying. But my understanding is if we want to take that approach as a budget process, and that's where we put forward our, our options at that point, just, I think we have to be clear about that. So there is options that we should be taking through the budget process, and this is part of that transformation. It will feed into that process. So I think there's an appropriate time when certain suggestions uh, should be put forward, and it's maybe not just right now. No, and as I said, there has been some examples of that done in, in budgets up until now. David? Um, so I, I submitted a, an EMES to, to clarify the position about participation request. And I think there, if, off the top of my head, uh, there was something like five had been made, maybe three had gone um, forward, quite um, minor ones. So as I had predicted a year before that or so, this scheme wouldn't work because it was pure, purely voluntary. But that's not to say it hasn't got a great potential. And I just think you, you're missing the point here by not um, I'm missing a great opportunity to harness a great workforce that's out there. But the second point, what I was looking for, was some understanding that our primary role is to, to serve the people. We're not here to be self-serving. Does anyone support that? I mean, we weren't quite going to the recommendations, but I think I'll just say that participation requests and that 
particular strategy sits with the Communities Committee, so actually we have to be careful that we're not operating without, out with our delegation. It would obviously be a really big transformation if we started to devolve the services down to the communities. You may actually disagree with that. I, you don't seem to have a great plan B, um, but um, there has to be something done for a transformation, transformation to work, given the scale of the cuts. I'm suggesting that. Are you saying it's a bad idea? No, I'm saying we're already doing it. Um, but I think we'll, we'll come back to the recommendations. David, uh, sorry, uh, David Stitt. I've attended three community council meetings and they have no intention of taking on council positions. I've asked all my community councils and I would say at Excuse least they're very interested. We go through the chair. Any other points on this particular item? Katie. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's really more sort of for information that I'm looking, my question is. I've had it said to me, as I'm sure many other councillors in the chamber have had this said to them too, that we have lots and lots of managers all telling you know, a few individuals what to do and that there seems to be a lot of middle management going on. And this is in relation to working with other agencies, so whether it's within social work or NHS. You know, some employees aren't quite sure which manager they're accountable for. It's just a question to ask, have we done a whole map of all our employees and who's accountable to what? So if there is any sort of double management going on, has that been looked at? It may well have. It's just a simple question, really. Have we done that exercise? Paul? We haven't done a, an absolute mapping exercise. However, we are confident that we've got the balance of responsibility. We, we remain the employer of people who are in the IGB space, and therefore we exercise that. But there are not joint management arrangements, but there are circumstances where some NHS managers assume certain parts of that, but we retain our responsibilities as an employer. So there's no duplication as such. Jane? Yeah, the point's been covered, thanks. Ian? I just, sorry, Chairman, please. I'm not looking for any, any response here, but I, just, I need to make it, make it clear for, for a from my, my, my perspective, and I think our group's perspective, and probably the wider council as well, but each individual can speak for themselves, but I certainly see myself as a public servant. Put the constituents' letter at first. We do do that. I think as a council, we do do that. So we've got our building a local economy, our high priorities, the best start life, so on and so forth. We've got our four main priorities, and we've got addendums to them as well, how we, how we see them being implemented. I just think it's right that we definitely do come back to the point you've made that we, we, we appreciate and we're loyal to our workforce and we get that loyalty return, but ultimately public services is what we adhere to, is what we look to achieve in the best way we possibly can. That's always at the forefront of our minds. And so, so going back to the point, David, I just wouldn't want to think that the public think that for a minute we are putting everybody else in front of our constituents when that's not the case. And through our priorities, we prove that. Any other questions on this particular transformation event? No. We will move on to the capital investment strategy, and Paul Garrett is here to answer any questions. Is there any questions on this particular transformation event? Nope. We will move on to income generation fees and charges, and we have Richard Greaveson here to answer any questions on this. Is there any particular questions on this transformation event? Jean? Um, it, it's, a, it's just a very minor point, but um, are we, are we looking at, at people who are charging, um, uh, who are advertising their properties for, B, for Airbnb and, and that similar sort of thing? Are we actually um, investigating when people are in fact running businesses? When uh, are uh, we Richard. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, so some discussion uh, in regard to uh, tourism uh, and specifically, and that will be included in the review moving forward. Any further questions on this transformation event? Nope. Uh, we will move on to the final transformation themed event, which is uh, school models. We've got Gillian Brazen here to answer any questions. Is there any questions that members have? Nope. Okay, then. If members are happy, we will therefore move to the... Oh, sorry, Jock. Sorry, Chair. I was a wee bit slow in uh, waking up there. Um, it's just a question, really, and it's a, it's a sensitive issue. Should we be looking at school closures in any way? Should we be looking at a forward plan as to how these sorts of things could be addressed? As you know, and I'm sure some of our members will know if they read the papers, 
Well, no, some of the number of pupils at some schools, especially primary schools, unfortunately, are very low. I, think, I believe we've got a secondary school in that state as well. Should we be looking at the situation with these schools and get into consultation with the parents and whatnot in, in the areas, looking forward to closing the schools where appropriate? I'm not looking at a mass closure by any manner of means, but should, should we be trying to address some of these issues? I think you, you've certainly opened a can of worms. I don't think there's a particular question in there, but I saw Ian Crither's hand went up. I, I think it's, it was, it was, it's similar, but it was different, and, and it's on the same lines as what uh, Jock's saying. But I see on page 34 for Gillian, it talks about the key messages from the workshop and, and the event, and it's uh, the second one uh, on the right says, We agreed that if we had shared criteria, that we had worked together with communities on setting out, that this, that this would help us start to see where change might be needed. So my interpretation of that is that, okay, we take forward a collective joint vision with the communities, education, so on and so forth. And I think that alludes to what uh, Council McKee is just saying. That's what I, my interpretation was that. So if, if that, just a reassurance that my interpretation that is right, that is our vision. We do take our communities, the people we're here to serve along with us. Gillian. Yes, the discussion at the transformation event was clear that change was necessary and that everybody agreed we needed to look at this in a different way but with communities with shared understanding of what communities expectations were and a recognition it would be difficult to please everyone but to take a long term and a strategic planning approach where everybody understood what we were facing was the outcome of the event and we've already started planning bringing back to this committee the work package that we will be involved the communities within that set of planning principles that we need to agree together. Jean? Um, does a long-term strategic approach um, include considering the kind of joint timetabling model um, that we've done in Dunfries Learning Town in other parts of the region? Not totally clear from this. That was the priority from the previous event, but we recognise that both events have to be taken together. But certainly the alignment of timetables is coming forward as an additional work package and work is progressing very well on that because timetables have to be agreed for subject choices in February. So we do need to move quite quickly for an August 20 start for alignment in partial and then more full alignment for August 21. Stephen? Yeah, it's a related point uh, to do with um, timetable alignment and uh, at recent um, parent council meeting at Lockerbie Academy this sort of came up and this was actually it touched on the subject of Network East which has been in this chamber before um, so there's an alignment uh, uh, timetable within the Dumfries uh, borough schools in terms of secondary not quite the same alignment in sort of Network East although I think that's kind of what the idea was to sort of move towards that so the campus model or the, or the, <coughs> the, the locality model could be applied kind of in each locality. Now, does, does it mean there's going to be an alignment of timetable across the region, a consistency in that way, or would it be in terms of each uh, locality, if you like, in terms of Annandale, um, Nithsdale, et cetera? Um, because clearly there would be differences between, you know, like so Lockerbie and um, Dumfries High, for example, in terms of start time, finish time, et cetera. And also where the periphery of that is where some pupils might need to take advantage of opportunities in Dumfries, but they're actually in Annan, then there's a there's a timetable issue there potentially if you do it in four areas or you know so it's really just when you say consistency across the region is it like by locality or across the region because I don't know if you'll get the ready really? agreement. No, I think we are looking to get agreement from all of the secondary heads to move to full alignment in time, but we're going to have to take school communities with us on that. But the first step is to do partial alignment for two columns across our schools in the localities so that they can work as network east or Network West, or within the Stuart tree. So that's the first step. But that'll be ready for column choices in February. And then we need to work with the secondary heads and taking on board uh, childcare arrangements, primary school alignments, the buses, clearly school meals arrangements, for example, our 2 to 18 schools have three sittings for lunch. So it seems a very simple thing to align a timetable. But if you've got a 2 to 18 school that has got three lunch sittings, comparing a timetable with a secondary school that has only one lunch sitting, we need to change the lunch times, which impacts on Alan Mawson's team. So lots of practicalities, but we're all working with the same intent, and we will get there. It's taking some steps over three timetables to do that. Stephen? I'm just, I mean, I'm 
Uh, I'm, I'm just minded of uh, the variation uh, to do with the waste contract in Wigtonshire, um, which was a sort of phased approach, locality by locality, didn't work the way we'd hoped maybe at the time. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there a, if it's not consistent and you've got four different timescales, then obviously that's going to impact on your transport arrangements, which is another theme in here. So I'm just sort of thinking, are we in danger of um, not seizing uh, the big opportunity ramming it through, getting it all done in a one hour, um, <clears throat> to be blunt, um, or you know, is the phased approach in danger of just creating future problems because you're going to have to, have everything else is going to be out of whack as well? I, I do think that is the, the crux of the question, is if we're looking at communities and communities looking at their lo local solutions or whether we take it in Friesen Galloway's strategic approach, I think in January we'll have a clearer decision from a secondary heads as to their preferences and I would be keen to bring that back to members. The newsletter actions, the work packages that we're bringing back to this committee in January have set out those options. These are already prepared and they'll be with Heather for Friday for this committee in January. But those are exactly the questions we want to ask. What are members' preferences about taking a longer term approach to bring alignment of timetable or whether we go forward with an increase in Galloway approach which may involve, and I'll say I know the secondary heads in the West have been discussing an asymmetric week there's been discussion for quite some time about changing the times of the school day to improve learning and teaching outcomes for pupils. That may be one of the discussions that comes forward to this committee. Yeah, Chair, it's on the very point that Gillian's making, the last one, and th there is an appetite for uh, change, transformation, call it as you will, in the West, at least with the two secondaries, uh, maybe not uh, referring to the primaries, but the two secondaries. But, and I have asked the question, in terms of, you know, you, you start changing the, 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 the day uh, and period times and so forth, but then are we coordinated in terms of all the other aspects, school meals, transport and everything, and I haven't had a, a satisfactory answer, you know, in, in terms of that. So we've set the hair running, but we may not have all the, the, the ends joined up uh, in that, so I think we've got to look at that. Uh, in terms of uh, my earlier remarks, Chair, and I, I've been at uh, some of the parent councils uh, west of the region, and it's this idea that we are, uh, as was put out, that we're going to uh, go on to a uh, two day per week for children on school meals, a hot meal, two days a week. And some of the, the, the rural schools, in, in, or rather the more rural areas, feel that there's a, a degree of discrimination. And I just wonder where that fits with, with children in terms of uh, free school meals uh, up to primary three, I believe it is. And the other one is, and I've referred to it again, and it's the additional sport needs. And again, a further 500, half a million pounds being suggested being taken out of additional support needs. And as I referred to, that almost a 48% well, reduction in the additional support for learner teachers. Uh, and the transformation that I attended in Stranraer, uh, so be it, it was uh, only a two hour and we didn't get the full two days and four days, etc. But it was clear that they didn't want uh, ASN anywhere near the budget uh, consideration for cuts. Uh, and you and I have met with a parent uh, and uh, that parent was clear in terms of the legislation uh, and the need to, to be inclusive uh, for disabled children, uh, for whatever the, the, the disability may be or disadvantage, that they do get the full education inclusive. And then we've got Article 24 in terms of the rights of, of, of the individual as a, dis, a disabled child. So I think when we're looking at this, we've got to have the, the complete reassurance that we are not running the risk of falling foul or in breach of any of these legislation. I think particularly on your first point, eh, that was an option that is on that has been published and is out for stakeholder engagement and isn't quite in the transformation process. That'll go through the budget setting process, which you'll be able to ans ask Chilling about um, in, in your own time. Is there anything you want to add on the additional support for learning point, Gillian? So, additional support for learning would clearly be one of the factors we would have to take on board for a planning principle for a school model. 
but it was the other transformation event which focused on additional support for learning as part of transformation. Is there any further questions? Sorry, Elaine. <clears throat> just, just to make the point that I think there's a wee bit of confusion between the transformation process and the savings options that officers presented to councillors. And I think Councillor Maitland already said this, there has been absolutely no decisions taken on any of those options. So that would include the ASL one, it includes the school meals one. Councillors have not agreed to any of these options. These are purely suggestions coming from officers. And I think it's quite important that we don't confuse that with the transformation process. And of course those options are for stakeholder engagement, some of which we are now getting. Willie, final point. Yeah, Chair, those were the, 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 what was presented at the transformation meeting I was at. Now, now if they're not there, and, and if Elaine or the leaders of the council are saying this, that we were not going to take, I'm quite hard, delighted to, to, to support her, and, and if need be, second her, that we don't take those as, as, as cuts. Okay, if there's no further points, shall we move to the recommendations? And the recommendation is to, number one, note the update on the transformation activity since the last report. We're happy to note... Uh, to note the progress on the delivery of agreed transformation events. Okay, happy to note that. Uh, number three is to note the outputs from the final six transformation events. We're quite happy to note. Uh, number four is to consider the outputs of the event. I think it's fair to say that we have um, thoroughly considered them. And item five is something we haven't actually discussed in detail, but is to note um, the progress on theme two to transform our customer experience and improve our digital offer to improve our digital office uh, and the update on activity at Appendix 7. We're happy to note. Sorry, switching myself off. Item 5 is the Council Revenue Budget Monitoring Report for 2019-20. This report provides a summary of the forecast expenditure for the Council up to the end of September 2019 and the measures being taken to manage budgets across services. Gillian Ross is here to assist members with any questions. Anything you want to add to the report? Open to members. Malcolm. Thank you, Chair. It was on page 43. Um, I'm never a great believer. I'm looking at a gift horse in the mouth. So the uh, uh, rebate we got for 1.42 million is very welcome. But I understand the position of trying to keep the change fund balance is up, and this is quite clearly a windfall payment. And I would like a bit of reassurance that it's going to be, it says here it's going to be treated as such, but that we're not going to take our foot off the gas when it comes to replenishing the change fund. Exactly. As we moved into a change fund, we're not um, changing the budget model. Do you want to confirm that, Paul? No, it, it has been treated as a windfall. This is the first time we've, we've actually received this income and we're currently working with the Scottish Government to sort of like um, go through the details and understand if we can sort of project whether there'll be any further opportunities for this type of windfalls going forward. But at this point in time, we've just adhered to the normal practice, which is to treat that um, windfall income as going straight to the change fund at this point in time. Of course, you can tell the Scottish Government are more than happy to take more. Katie? Thank you, Chair. It was on the same point. I just was looking for assurances that there weren't any conditions attached to that money. No, the stipulation of the scheme is whereby you are able to generate additional rates income over and above the buoyancy target. You get to keep 50% of that income. And so we've just received the notification through from the Scottish Government with that indication. So. Jane? Um, paragraph 3.26 the bottom of page 44. Um, the figure there in the table, allowance for delay in delivery of agreed savings, is any of that carried forward from more than one year? No, it's the details are within Appendix 2. It's specifically in relation to the savings that have been agreed as part of the 1920 budget. And as we've got within Appendix 2, they're anticipated to be one-off shortfall at this stage. Yep, Jane. There's one more question. Um, I see that the, the, um, the lottery, the sort of notion for a staff lottery that we were going to save ourselves, 196, was it? Um, yeah, 196,000 um, pounds. Um, now, what's going on there? Um, 
I mean, if we can't do it ourselves, should we not just procure it, outsource it? My understanding we had maybe we were buying a package. Have we got an update here? Councillor Maitland, we've been working with the Improvement Service. A number of councils are looking at both community and staff lotteries, so we're, we're plugged into that. That's taken a bit longer than was intended, but we feel it's um, more productive to work with other local authorities to, to move that forward. Elaine? Yes, it's a, uh, about the reduced business rates within schools on page 45. It's referred to as, um, it's referred to in the earlier page, I've just lost it, oh, yes, in 3.14, reducing the council's rates bill. I just wonder whose rates bill has actually been reduced. And if it's actually a reduction in the rates bills on schools, surely that belongs to the education department rather than the change fund? Gillian. Um, the way that we work the rates um, allocations at the moment is it's treated as a council expense and so any increases in the rates bill is, is provided to the services accordingly. So basically we maintain the budget as a council. So where there are these reductions, we, we accumulate them back within the council's funds as a total. Jeff. It's uh, 3.7, the additional funding for uh, additional pupil support. It's estimated we're going to get £400,000 in this uh, financial year, given we're two-thirds of the way mm -hmm. through the financial year. Do we have any indication about when it will actually be allocated? We haven't yet received um, details of the new financial circular for the year. Um, there are notifications throughout the year as to amounts that are due to the Council, but when we actually receive the money is usually the last two weeks in March. But we, we've all obviously got a firm indication that money will be coming. We're just waiting for the final announcement to come through with the exact figure. Willie. Yeah, Chair, I know it's on page 47, there's a detail of where we are. And in the first two, in education, we're 451,000 uh, adrift. And again, in social work, uh, 324 and we're well into this year. I then look at page 43 that recognises while uh, there are a number of pressures that may require support from the funding including additional learning support, <coughs> uh, school transport, residential costs, etc. Uh, my point here is uh, that that's nearly three quarters of a million pound uh, in uh, that and we are in, well into this financial year. It's the pressure that's going to be put on both services in trying to bring that budget into line. And I would hope that there is nobody being put at risk. Uh, and my next point is that as we move forward into the uh, forthcoming year and, and budget setting, that we do, as members, take cognizance of the additional learning support in that it is some 451,000 adrift and my reference to the 500,000 pound savings that has gone out uh, as a potential. The paragraph 3.15 of the report does refer to corporate budget pressures funding which is being held corporately at the moment. We'll allocate that to the service if that's necessary. Uh, we work with all services to try and support them to contain overall expenditure within the agreed budget level. If we have to uh, use some of that budget pressures funding to assist, that will come back to this committee for further consideration. And obviously all budget pressures will be considered as we update the Council's budget model to support members in their budget setting considerations for next year, so we can look at these pressures at that stage as well. Yeah. Any further questions? Stephen? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, um, firstly, can I thank um, the preparers of the report for the additional column for the savings achieved to date in year, because that's actually made it a lot easier just to read at a glance. So thank you for that. Um, it was actually on 3.7 as well, uh, and again, this is uh, harking back to the uh, parent council meeting at Lockerbie, where it was mentioned about the three-year funding um, for like counselling services in schools, and I think that was, if memory serves, 1.8 million over three years, roughly, um, and that's to be worked out. Is that is that a ticket? That's a separate. Funding from this is that going to be addressed separately? But but it just wasn't included this in this report. Yeah. Thank, no, that that is separate from from that money. There has been some debate 
uh, causally during the course of the year as to the approach to the allocation of that funding. It was originally intended that it would be one councillor per school, and there's now a kind of hybrid model for the allocation of that money, which has held up the, the distribution, but that's now been finalised for the current year, and we're, we're taking that into account in our projections that reflect in this report, but separate from that, that money is referred to there. Okay, any further questions? Mm -hmm. No. Nope. We will move to the recommendations. They're all to note, and we're quite happy to note uh, one, two, and three on block. Okay. Item number six is a finance and procurement revenue budget monitoring report. This report provides an overview of the financial performance of the finance and procurement service. Paul Garrett is here to answer any questions. Is there any questions from members on this report? Nope. Okay. We'll move to the recommendations then. Are we quite happy to know one? Stephen? What, you moved too fast for me. Um, what it is, is on page 57, it, it shows two lines at uh, 21k um, underspend in Appendix 1 due to vacancies, I think. Obviously, from from board uh, work, I suppose, um, there's been a questions asked about um, support within the procurement team um, and maybe sort of pressures there in terms of actually getting through the workload for procurement. So which 21K is it, where, where is it, which, you know, which one are we sort of supporting, which one are we sort of taking, if you like? No, we're not taking either. Basically, what that table on page 57 reflects is the, the variance is the potential current projected under or overspends against each of the individual sections in finance and procurement. But uh, in terms of the resourcing and procurement, we have had quite a bit of change in that team and some vacancies of late. Those have recently been replaced. We've now got the team back up to strength. But obviously, there's a development period and support period to allow officers to take on new responsibilities. So we're hoping to address some of those uh, pressures and resource issues of this period because we've now got the team back up to strength. OK, any further questions? No, nope. we'll move to recommendations, and we're happy to take uh, to note one and two on block. Okay. Item number seven is the implementation of Financial Code 11 debt write-offs. This report is brought forward to provide details of debts written off under delegated procedures over the six-month period to September uh, 2019 for member scrutiny. Lindsay Wilson is here to answer any questions. Anything you want to add to the report, Lindsay? No. Any questions from members? Jeff? Maybe I've misread the report, but on page 67, the second uh, uh, line from the bottom, overpaid housing benefit, there was one overpaid housing benefit according to the text, and that was £19,300. So that was an overpayment of one individual of £19,000 in a year. Right. How did that happen? You're correct. It's one individual, but it wasn't over one year. This was something that was discovered in 2018-19. However, it related to the period from 2007 to 2019. Uh, it was something that hadn't been picked up. An individual moved into residential care, and it was identified at that stage that they were, had been previously in a shared tenancy when that hadn't previously been understood. Uh, this didn't actually count the cost of council. The write-off is uh, absorbed by the DW, DWP, sorry. as long as we're within certain thresholds, they pick that up. So there's no direct impact on the Council from this. Okay. Alcom. Thank you, Chair. Again, it's on page 67, and it relates to the, the write-off for Debenhams CBA. And I know we talk about risk quite a lot in here, and I was really wondering if this is a risk that we're taking or not cognizance on going forward, the potential with the uh, difficulties in the retail sector and our income projections for the future. Is this perhaps maybe the start of a trend? It's something what we're conscious of, but in terms of income projections for the future, rates income is pulled at a national level. So obviously what we're doing is liaising with the Scottish Government on their projections for overall non-domestic rates income. It's not something we need to directly look at in terms of impacts within this region. It's really the impact on the overall national pot. And obviously the Scottish Government update those projections as part of their budget. 
and part of their funding for local government finance settlements. So we'll continue to monitor that with the Scottish Government. Billy. Hi, Chair. It's again page 67, and we see the Border Cars Group. Uh, you know, and uh, there's three different ones there. Is that, in terms of the liability, could, could that, or, or, or is there any way that can be pursued on an individual basis, or if the, 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 the company has uh, rebranded, reopened up again under a different name? Just ask the question, Chair. Um, Chair. My understanding, uh, Border Cars are a limited company, um, so we can't um, go on an individual basis um, and collect rates from them. Um, I think the actual company concerned has um, has now been split, and it's it's um, different car franchises that are actually taking their work on board. So there's no way we could go go forward and collect rates from them. Any further questions? Doug? Yeah, I'm just curious, really. Sorry, just out of the box here. It's uh, Green Sands Regeneration. Who, who are they? I'm sorry, I don't actually have that information to hand. I can certainly find out and, and come back to you with that information. Um, I don't actually know that personally at this point. You'll find them on company's house, I'm sure. Any further questions? Nope. So are members happy to take the recommendations on block, and that is to note and scrutinise one and two. Agreed. Item number eight is a Treasury Management Mid-Year Review 2019-20. This report is a requirement of the SIPFA Code of Practice on Treasury Management, which the Council signed up to in 2010 and has complied with since. The report sets out the transactions and debt performance from the period 1st of April to 30th of September this year. Karen Donaldson is here to answer any questions. Is there any questions from members? Malcolm? Thank you, Chair. It's uh, page 80, uh, item 4.4, compliance with Treasury limits and prudential indicators. Um, I see we managed to, to breach the limit, a limit which we spent an awful lot of time discussing in the last year to raise it from 20 to 25. So there are kind of two parts to this. Is the 25 enough? And then the next part is, how was the matter rectified? Was there money, money paid in? Did you have an uncashed check lying around in your drawer or something? Uh, so where did, where did the funds come from to rectify the situation? Karen. Um, just to, to take that one, I mean, the £25 million, it was obviously increased about 18 months ago from the £20 million because this situation was happening more regularly than we would like. I mean, normal day-to-day, -day, £25 million is is relatively easy to to maintain within. The reason that the, of the counterparty breach was basically um, two fairly substantial payments both came in earlier than we would normally expect them. I mean, like for instance, with the NHS resource transfer, about £5 million, and then an HMRC uh, VAT payment that came in about four days earlier than it normally would, um, which provides a challenge. And to be honest, it was just the circumstances of both happening at the same time on the same day. Um, but again, it was rectified that day, um, and we managed to transfer funds to our deposit account in another bank just to make sure we weren't breaching the counterparty limits um, for the closing balance. So again, it is just unfortunate circumstances and it's generally um, we're, we're quite comfortably within the 25 million. Welcome. Yeah, so the funds were transferred from another deposit account. So we were, it was a shortage of funds. Am I correct in saying that, or was it income no, that you received that put you over the limit? Yeah, we actually we ended up having more than £25 million in our normal, like, everyday banking account, which obviously we set that limit to, to manage risk, that that's the maximum we'll have with any one financial institution. So to rectify that, we transferred money to the Bank of Scotland to bring, uh, to the Royal Bank of Scotland to bring our Bank of Scotland balance down below £25 million. Thank you, Chair. I have um, three questions. 
Um, the first is about uh, the interest paid to um, common good accounts. Um, that rose from a very um, modest amount to uh, quite a, well, some would say satisfactory amount. I just wonder what the thinking was behind that. Um, do we somewhere have um, scenarios we can look at um, to determine what would happen if interest rates fluctuated a lot in the next few years? And the third one is again on, on the backing, the asset backing of our debt. Um, you know, initially um, we were told that was backed on assets. I had, I had a look at that, you know, it was property portfolio. And then I found out that it was the property portfolio based on the um, cost of replacing the buildings rather than the co you know what we could realize the buildings for. So um, can we agree that this is more of a, a technical asset backing rather than a, a, a real asset backing of our, our debt? Thanks, Chair. It's time to put those in order. Uh, yeah, we did a review of the interest we're paying to the Common Good Funds earlier this year. It uh, has traditionally been linked to the average pool rate that we pay on the, the loans fund, uh, and that's t tended to be linked to the bank base rate. Because the bank base rate has been so low in recent years, the common good have been receiving very little income as a result of that. Uh, we had to look at the periods over which the common good was depositing money with the loans fund, and they were generally holding that money for we were generally holding that money for long periods, but we weren't the common goods weren't benefiting from that. So we felt it was more appropriate to apply a longer term rate to the amounts that are deposited by the common good funds and up to rate accordingly. So we felt that was fair to both the common good funds and to the loans fund. Uh, interest rate fluctuations. I mean, absolutely, I mean, this is something that we are very conscious of and are monitoring on a daily basis effectively and we're getting some external support and forecasts in terms of interest rates and obviously there's potential changes with a number of developments over the upcoming period. One of the things we are looking at regularly is when we switch from our current approach of holding substantial temporary borrowing when we move back into longer term borrowing. Uh, so we're constantly looking at the market, looking at forward projections to assess when we should make those, those type of moves. So that's absolutely something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the third point was on the, the asset backing of our debt. Uh, I mean, the council does hold uh, assets which are valued, based largely on replacement value, as I said, substantially in excess of the level of debt that the council holds. Uh, also, the approach that local government is required to take in terms of funding its borrowing is to write that borrowing off over a period over which the council benefits from the use of the assets. Any review of that would identify that we're actually writing off our debt earlier. And it's a case we write off debt before, while we're still using our assets. And quite often we have quite a number of years left in particular buildings and infrastructure once the debt has been repaid off. So I think it's perfectly appropriate the approach we're taking at the minute on that basis. Jane, may I come in quickly again yeah, on thanks, the second? Thanks. My, my point was on to it in point two. There. Thank you. David. Um, I realise that the uh, fluctuation in interest rates is, is, is daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. It would be quite um, difficult for us to understand all the possibilities and predict your actions should those eventually to occur. But is there um, any um, a graphical output that we could look at so that to help councillors make decisions as to whether it is prudent to increase debt or not. Um, how would we think about, well, the what-if scenario of interest rates were 10% three years from now? Fine. Well, members agree our Treasury Management Strategy each year in March. This is a report providing a monitoring against that strategy, and that strategy has su substantial information in terms of ongoing uh, future interest rate forecasts and what that strategy does is members agree to give us parameters to work within. So that allows us to undertake our day-to-day -day treasury management activities within that strategy that's been agreed by members. If we feel that you need to revise that strategy, we will come back to members asking for that authority. That's something that would be reflected in, in these reports. What we've said in this report is that we have been able to date to operate within the case strategy and don't see a need to change it at this stage. But if there is a need to go back and ask members to reconsider the strategy, we'll do that at that 
at that point? Sorry, it's, it's not really the day-to-day -day strategy I'm concerned about. It's just the sort of the what if in three years things were much different than they were today. What position would we be in uh, based on the trajectory we're on now so we could understand that because it be, could be a, a huge budgetary implication for us, five or ten million or something like this, I don't know. And we, we would have to think then, is it worth staying on the, the risk path that we're on at the moment or should we deviate? We don't have uh, any feel for that at all. We're only responding to what you might feed us daily. I don't see how we're going to make good strategic decisions. Sorry, maybe I wasn't clear in that, that, that previous answer. I wasn't talking specifically about day-to-day -day in terms of that, that previous answer. I was talking about the longer-term strategy that members set for us in March each year. That, that strategy is to determine our borrowing activities over the upcoming year, but on a longer-term basis to fund the Council's long-term borrowing and investment requirements. So that is something we give members some detailed information on. Uh, members, as I say, set us the parameters to operate within. If we feel as though that needs to be revised prior to March, then we would come back to members asking for that authority at that stage. OK. Ian. Thank you, Chair. Just for clarity, Paul, in regards to the point that Malcolm picked up on the £3 million overspend, is that the same funding as, as what's been identified within the internal audit review uh, in Auditor Scrutiny Committee's paper tomorrow? The reason I ask that will be a secondary question, if it is. No, it's, it's separate. OK, thank you. That makes sense now. Thank you. Stephen? Yeah, just, uh, I was actually going to ask, because um, uh, it's coming up tomorrow in the audit risk and scrutiny, about three million, and maybe that's a thing that's to do with uh, the, the delegated authority and how Treasury management works, but that may be coming back at a future committee anyway. Um, just on another point, I think it's more, normally when we're, um, sort of a ready reckoner is like million quid, 70k a year. So um, if it comes to this sort of a percentage increase what kind of impact would if we were ready reckoning next year and we were sort of faced with a choice between well here's the options this is the likely interest rate our borrowing is going to be at what would that convert into if it was one percent increase would it be like 80 grand you know i mean what would be the the, the sort of a uh, ready reckoner figure if you like for the layman the majority of that, that 70000 a year is the repayment of the principal element, rather as the interest, so it would be a relatively marginal impact. I think probably the, the, the bigger consideration in terms of what would influence that, rather than interest rate, is actually the period over which the relevant borrowing should be uh, written off. Uh, if it's longer term assets, such as new build buildings or, or con construction activities, that tends to be a longer period. But if our investment strategy was focused more on shorter term investments, whether that be vehicles, IT and so forth, that would push that £70,000 calculation up. But we'll come back to members in January, I think, with details to support members in considering the ongoing development of the capital investment strategy and provide further information on that in that report. OK, any further questions? No. We'll move to the recommendations then. Members happy to note the financial and physical progress. I'm reading the wrong recommendation, apologies. Our members asked, happy to note the transactions and debt performance for the period 1st of April to 30th of September, as detailed in the appendix Treasury Management Mid-Year Review 1920. Okay. Item number nine is the capital investment strategy monitoring for 2019-20 in quarter two. This report provides members with an update on the financial and physical progress of the capital programme for the current financial year. Karen Donaldson is here to speak to the report. Is there any questions from members? Katie? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's, it's in relation to the flood protection schemes that are marked on page 92. Um, it makes reference to the Newton-Stewart flood protection scheme, and it makes reference to the fact that the costings for this has gone up. Now, I'm aware that there is funding up to 80% from Scottish Government, and I'm wondering, has that funding been agreed with Scottish Government? With the increased costs, are we looking to then get more funding from Scottish Government? Obviously, there is a finite amount of resources there, and it's not just the Newton-Stewart project. It's obviously the Langham Flood Protection Scheme is in there as well, and also Stranraer Flood Protection Scheme. So whereabouts are we in terms of that 80% funding, is that already fixed or is that an ongoing application process? Paul? 
Yeah, um, in relation to the flood schemes, it is, I suppose, an, an ongoing process with the Scottish Government. We're required to provide updated costings for all our flood prevention schemes in October each year. So at the start of October, we provided the Scottish Government with our updated uh, costings for all the flood schemes. And certainly, whilst obviously we've not got the settlement yet and we've not got formal confirmation that those um, additional funds have been agreed, certainly the indication from the government is that we'll continue to support 80 percent of the cost and we've not had anything to say otherwise and i suppose it's important to note that we're not alone in this um the, the cost of the schemes are going up across scotland it's not just a dumfries and galloway um issue but certainly we've not had anything from the government to suggest that their position would change in in any means so katie yeah if i could just come back thank you chair um so if the cost rises again and we submit again in October next year, is that a likely situation that would happen? Do we, you know, would we be looking at submitting every year on the same scheme? Yes, we would submit every year on the same scheme until it got to the point of tender acceptance. And then once the tender's accepted, that's our, our, our final funding is based on that figure. So once we get to the, the tender point, that's when the sort of cut off and that's our, our final agreed funding. Any further questions? Malcolm? Again, it's to come back on the flood prevention schemes. I mean, the cost rises here are absolutely horrific. Um, and if you were to extrapolate some of these rises across the, the amount that's still in the, in the plan for the White Sands scheme, it would be, it would be 80 million pounds quite easily if you if you ramp it up to the same degree and what you've got to remember is we're getting we'll get 80 percent back and i understand fully the flood prevention schemes throughout the country are showing these sort of trends so i don't think the white sands one would be any different but again it's capital that we're spending here that is being taken away from somewhere else and sometimes there's got to come a point where some of these schemes particularly the the white sands one that i know we're waiting on for the results from the Scottish Government, but there comes a point where people have got to make the choice. Is it value for money? Would we rather spend capital on our schools or whatever? But it comes down to a choice at the end of the day. And these figures are truly alarming. So I don't know where we go with this, but we obviously need to wait on the result from the Scottish Government. But I think it really needs to be revisited. Okay, Stephen. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just a quick one on the uh, Glen Luce Traveller site. Um, it was just actually that's scheduled to start December. Ne well, now this month. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a bit of slippage according to the report due to the duration of the works, uh, 20 weeks, um, and that's only to take it to minimum standard, not sort of enhanced standard or anything. Um, has that actually started now? Just for information, appreciate this report might have been written prior to that. Yeah, I understand at the time of writing that was the the case, but I understand that. There's been some additional work required with the tenders, and it's it's now going to be in January start or aiming for a January start was the the latest position I had heard. So, chair, just to come back on that, does that affect the amount of slippage into the next financial year? Then, given the duration of the works outlined in this report, uh, yes, it will do, and that'll be reflected in the the end of December report that'll come to the committee in the new year. Yep. Hi, thanks, chair. Just a wee worry on Kerguelen Cemetery. What's the deed of servitude? Anyone able to answer that? I'm sure you can get the answer outside. David? Uh, thank you, Chair. Well done to um, Councillor Johnson for raising the uh, the opportunity cost in, in trying to finance uh, some of these schemes, particularly the White Stones Flood Prevention Scheme, which is um, absolutely our HS2. Um, Pleased to see that the Colin uh, Gypsy Park is not not on this list. I think one one is enough for us. Um, at another committee, I, I expressed the desire that we should um, think about and discuss the the Garach. Um, can I just have a clarification? Um, when we talk about asset class and our investments within them, do we do we actually discuss um, investments in buildings that we don't own as well? Is that and would it be likely that the Garach would ever come up at one of these meetings? I think first of all, you may want to just watch what you're saying, David. I mean, first of all, they're not parks. They're, they're gypsy traveller sites. 
Um, but Karen, have you got an answer for that? The asset classes are, are largely based on investment in the council's own assets. The council is able to invest in third party assets, but generally through our asset classes, we're investing in the council's own uh, assets. If there's any issues where that's not the case, we'd certainly come back to members and give them full details on that. Right. Ian. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one question on is it three point. Uh, where is it? Sorry, no, it's uh, 3.13, aye. It's in regards to the capital receipts. We've got a target there, half a million pound. Clearly, we've achieved 40k, I think it says. So I was just wondering what what, what impact is the uh, community asset transfer having on that? I suppose is one thing. We're looking at that, I think, through the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee as a potential uh, scrutiny review going forward. But what impact is that having? How achievable do you think this actual, uh, this say, uh, 500k is? And just coming back to the, the flood schemes. That's for capital investment strategy. There, there is obviously a link there. So if you take the, the I think it's the Newton Stewart, so the overspend potential in there, that would lift the White Sands project from its current status up to around 38 million. If you took the Langham as a, as a trajectory, that would lift it to near 100 million. If you apply that across different projects within our capital strategy, I think we have to have a, a good hard look and reflection on that, whether it's now or whether it's at the budget budget process. I mean, it, to me, it looks, if you do have proper impact, financial impact assessment and it's unachievable. The council cannot afford the level of capital that it's investing at this moment in time, particularly around these uh, types of schemes. So, I mean, I suppose that's a point, but how achievable is our uh, half a million pound target in, in regards to capital receipts and what impact do we know if, if we do know uh, is uh, community asset transfer having on that? Um, well, with regards to the, the delivery of the target for capital receipts, Obviously, the receipts to date are low. However, we are constantly liaising with property services to get an update on um, the position, and we're aware of a number of properties that are currently sort of going through sort of the final sort of legal stages, or there's a closing date set for the end of December. And if all of those um, sales go through as planned, um, we will reach the, the five hundred thousand pound target. Um, it's just obviously just. It varies, like the, the timing of them. Obviously, I think we've got four uh, buildings closing at the end, well, closing date at the end of December. So it is just timing at this stage. So once we get an update on that position, then we'll reflect that in the next report, and then hopefully we'll see the, the figure um, increasing quite substantially. Um, with regards to community asset transfer, I mean, of course, to a degree, it will have a, an impact. However, I suppose it's important to to weigh up the, the sort of revenue savings we get from passing our assets on to be managed by other organisations and obviously some of these properties would be quite hard to market as well so it is definitely um, a balancing act um, and I suppose that's why they do come to members for that um, consideration if they are being transferred at less than market value but again it will have an impact but again it's got to be balanced with the, the other um, implications. Malcolm. Thank you, Chair. It was just about the report, uh, Appendix 1, page 95. Um, clearly, we're still, we're still showing the figures in here for the agreed capital expenditure, but we've, we've had updates there that things are potentially going to have to change. And also, some of the expenditure has obviously been pre-2718, and again, it might be helpful for some of these projects to have a, a column with... Uh, total spend to date or expected expenditure, just just for guidance and for information. I think it would give a bit of clarity to some of the things. Yeah, that's that's no problem at all. We've, we've got that information at hand so we can add that in, maybe particularly for the priority projects. It's a little more difficult to do with asset classes. But, I mean, in Appendix 2, within the priority projects, it does give prior year spend as well. So, okay. I just like some, everything simple and on one page. Any further questions? Nope. I'm happy to move to the recommendations, and that is to note the financial and physical progress against the 2019 20 capital programme. The agenda item 10 is the Silver Craigs Caravan Park proposed asset transfer to the Kukubri Development Trust. This report presents members with a proposed community asset transfer for the Silver Craigs Caravan Park in Kukubri detailed in the appendices to the Kukubri Development Trust. Ingrid Gemmold, Ward Manager, is here to answer any questions. Ingrid, is there anything you want to add to the report? 
Thanks, Chair. No, nothing to add to the report. Apologies, Colin. I didn't see you there. Colin Freeman is also here to answer any questions. Is there any questions from members on the report? Well, no, but um, I mean, if members sort of looked at it, you, you, they would realise that there has been a change from um, a recommendation for an asset transfer to, to a, a long-term lease. Um, and that came about because suddenly, just suddenly, amazingly, this appeared in the common good um, asset list. Um, and, uh, and so we skidded to a halt and thought that with the community, the community didn't want it to go to community asset transfer. They wanted a long lease on that basis. So really, I suppose um, it's a kind of slightly oblique question, but I mean, how many more are going to suddenly appear as being common good um, um, lands and, and assets um, that we don't know about? We're constantly told that this is the fin final number, final list. But I'm just curious to know what the system is. What is, what is going on that this is suddenly all appearing? Um, also, actually, Chairman, can I agree recommendations that I think the recommendation, as stated, to, uh, to go for a long lease is exactly the correct one? No, I think having had many conversations in my own ward about common good, having a final list would be nice, but I think the fact that nobody seems to have cared about them for 20 or 30 years and then all of a sudden there's interest is probably part of the problem. Have any of you got a crystal ball to tell us when the final list will be available? No. Chair, thank you. Uh, there's no final list at the moment, but we are working, uh, the community, community plan and engagement services working more closely with property and architectural services <coughs> to make sure that at the early stages during the community asset transfer, we identify where an asset is or is not a common good uh, asset, and then we move forward from there. Stephen? Yeah, and very prescient, Chairman, because our meeting last night at Loch Maven Community Council, we heard a little bit more about Common Good, which was uh, always informative. Um, in terms of the long-term lease, I think just in light of the officer's comment in the last report where we can enjoy revenue savings from passing assets to other organisations, I think I would take comfort in getting the assurance that if it is indeed a long-term lease, that we effectively... Obviously, in the business case and, and the history, it actually describes the amount of work the organisation has done to sort of uh, make good the asset effectively and make it marketable, uh, where we where we effectively failed. Um, so with that in mind, I take it we are not going to have a liability for the maintenance of the ground, um, otherwise there's no saving at all. Thanks, Chair. Um, I can confirm that under the current uh, service level agreement that the, the trusts are holding, they are covering all costs. And as it says in the report, they will continue to do so for the term of the lease. Okay. Any further questions? Ian? I suppose we picked up a very similar circumstance in Annan Common Good. Uh, it's more long standing, it isn't just a new thing, but it's Common Good land, and there's a caravan park, it's one of the, the, the lands there. And it's on a profit sharing as well. I just, I just wondered, one of the things we did consider, and we had a very uh, positive conversation around about, is how do Potentially, so if say, say the the trust makes a thousand pounds, the council will receive a five hundred pound benefit. Uh, so one of the things we did come to the conclusion at the last meeting is that that might be better spent in a reinvestment in the actual land asset itself. We see improvements, see benefit that way. So I just wondered if that was one of the considerations within this uh, type of agreement. Would that be a way forward? From where we're in a profit share, and I just didn't get a chance to read the whole thing in good. In good. Um, so what? What has um, been put forward in terms of the business plan is that the organisation are reinvesting all profit back into the park to bring it up to a, a higher standard. Um, any profit um, thereafter will then be reinvested back into the community. Okay, okay. Any further questions? No, nope. I think that Jane had a, a recommendation that I presume was to go for option four. And anybody who is not in agreement? So in terms of the recommendations, I think it's fair to say we have considered the, the business plan. Uh, we have in the mix noted and considered the recommendation of Kirkubri Common Good, and we're agreeing to a long-term lease as stated in option four in the report. Okay, and I think that that's agreed. Uh, I have no urgent business uh, to take part in, so thank you very much for this morning and enjoy the rest of your day.